Hello and welcome to the first episode of 2022. Uh, we're talking about watches, time, how to spend it. Nothing's changed there, Andy. What's changed with you? Season three, Felix. We've made it our third lap around the podcast sun. Yeah, I was thinking, we should, do we need to like change our tagline or our brand identity? Uh, I definitely need to update our artwork. This is just reminded me. So yeah, yep. I also think like <laughs> 2022. I, I had a look at like our podcast description where we talk about watch matchmaker a lot. We don't really do that mm. so much. So maybe we need to. We should pick that back up in this year. Although I got to say, quick plug to our Discord, we get a lot Kinda of happens you know, there. Yeah, a lot of crowdsourcing, a lot of crowdsourcing opinions on uh, watch matchmaking. Um, yep. It's a great place to be, and make sure you join. We've seen a, seen quite a few new people uh, jump in our Discord yep. over the last week. Obviously, had a bit of time over Christmas. Yep, yep. They've been attracted to our um, phenomenal chat with um, Deep Fact Tom Cruise. Yeah, it's the direct line into to Felix and I. Uh, so it is it is the holiday season. It's uh, it's January. It's the first week of January, Felix. We're not. We're not going to give you a whole lot of new content, but nah. I figured it would be a uh, a good chance to kind of relive and re-edit and remaster, if you will, my one of my personal favourite episodes. This is like uh, a that... Taylor's version of OT <laughs> <Yeah>. podcast. <laughs> um, James Cox, who we had on, I think it was 2020. Nine, 20, yeah. This is like one of our very first, I reckon like it was pretty early in the piece. Eight or so 10. if you're new. Yeah, if you're new, if you're new to OT uh, or you joined us last year and you haven't caught the episode, it's sort of the one I'm really proud of and I send out to everyone and, and say, yeah, you should definitely check it out. It's a really cool kind of human story. And it, By the way, and it is. we're proud of all the episodes. We're uh, very proud. We're, we're proud to be here. Episodes. But that was like a, over 100 episodes ago, Andy. So it's I, wow. I think it's very plausible that people have come along and haven't yeah. heard that one before. Well, now's your chance. James Cox, if the name sounds familiar but you can't quite place it, he is the uh, he's the man who owned the Paul Newman Paul Newman Daytona that Phillips famously sold in 2019, I think it was for 17 and a half million, cool Jeez. cool 17.5 mil, uh, setting all sorts of records back then. Yeah. But he was sort of gifted the watch by Paul Newman himself. He was in a relationship with Paul Newman's daughter, and yeah, we we just dove right into it. We heard all about you know what the ownership was like because he had that watch for like 25, 30 years, I think, all in. That's a fascinating and story. It's really cool. It's really yeah. cool. So, yeah, that's what uh, that's what today's episode is going to be about. Felix, we do have a uh, a new sponsor for twenty twenty two. Yes, we should uh, listen to what we have to say about them right now, Andy. <laughs> I will. Uh, I'll insert that now. And now, Andy, time to have a quick chat about this week's sponsor, Artem Strap. Let's get right into it. Australia's own Artem makes some of the best sailcloth straps we've seen. Period. Sailcloth straps are great. They offer a, a casual look and they won't get ruined by water. Too often I find they're cheap, perhaps even downright nasty. Mm. All that, they come on like super high-end pieces that are brand specific. Artem offers something different. They're supple right out of the box and the finish is excellent and they have a feel on the wrist that, that I find lovely. I currently have an Artem strap on my Bremont as well as my Nomos Ahoy and I have not taken them off since I got them. Andy, what makes a great sailcloth strap? That's a good question, Felix. There is a bit of a secret sauce in Artem straps, but we do know that they have a synthetic upper with an underside that is a mix of cowhide sealed with rubber to provide a smooth and water-resistant seal on the surface that touches your wrist. These high-quality materials and the attention to detail mean that it has a really pleasing satin sheen that conforms well on the wrist and you know offers that water resistance. It's the smooth underside that sells it for me, Andy. Artem currently offer black straps with white, grey or black stitching in widths from 19 millimetres all the way up to 23. So that's 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23 millimetres as well as a few lengths. They have some exciting updates in development too. Stay tuned for those. Yeah, I'm looking to looking forward to seeing what Artem do in 2022. But Felix, do not forget the buckles. They offer a few different buckle styles, which live up to that same quality we've mentioned of the straps. And that includes a really solid deployment option. Yeah, speaking of the deployments, a bit of a, a new thing out of the gate for them. Check out mm. the new style sailcloth that is reminiscent of Amiga's canvas strap. Comes with no keepers, which a lot of people will like. And that makes it tailor-made for that deployment buckle. Love it. To find out more about Artem's wonderful sailcloth straps, head to artemstraps.com. That is A-R-T-E-M straps.com. Love it, Andy. Let's get back to the show. Uh, it's great to have Artem straps on board, Felix, uh, fellow Australians. So Tell you very what, cool. hot weather down here at the moment. Uh, mm. I am appreciating the water resistance and uh, wicking nature of the old... <laughs> 
the old sailcloth strap at the moment because my wrists are sweaty. Sweaty. Too, too many late nights in the hot tub. <laughs> Never wear a mechanical watch in a hot tub. That's like watch 101. Hey, Andy, before we get James on, I think we should do some of the um, Herdinky-inspired reflection about what mm. watch we wore most in 2021. Do you want to start? Uh, I mean, yeah, I can. Uh, I need to remember what the reference number is, though. It's the 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 most boring Grand Seiko in the world that I love very, very much. Uh, it's something something 009. It's the, the Quartz Champagne Dial guy that was new. So I only got mm. it like halfway through the year, but... It's it's just such a like quartz is a game changer, Andy. Like I don't have to worry if it's wound. So if I'm just like running out and I need to, not that I did that this year, ran anywhere. Um, if I needed to like just put on a watch and not have to wind it or anything, it's grab it and go. It's so good, Andy. What about you? It's interesting. That, well, I'll, on, before I answer on the quartz notes, uh, I'll give a little plug to two brands. Oh yeah, the Bright, Breitling Endurance. So one of our one of our friends. Bernard Funk, who is yeah, Friday yeah, Flyback yeah. on Instagram, yeah, yeah, yeah. owns a owns a Aussie couple of couple of boutiques, Monarchs. Yep. He has been like religiously wearing the endurance. Yeah. And I think he's got the yellow with the um so it's obviously the carbon fiber case with the quartz and the It's not carbon fiber, the, it's bright light. That's oh, bright light, sorry. I think. I think. Uh, something. Looks like carbon fiber. Mm-hmm. And no, no, actually, no, it doesn't really. I think, um, it's a, I think it might be um uh what do they make that kayaks and stuff out of? Um Fiberglass, that sort of thing. Fiberglass, yeah, you're Something right. Like yeah, that. I'm confusing it with the um with the Bamford. Easy, easy uh, to do. Easy to do. Uh, yellow rubber strap. But he was telling me I had coffee with him last week, and he was telling me how his wife accidentally put it through the washing machine. That's incredible. And you know what? Came out ticking perfectly Absol- fine. Why? Why wouldn't it? Honestly, like. And he, this is this is his. I think his. This will be his most worn watch of 2021 to answer for for Bernard. Thank you, Bernard. And, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like he's got a Gruber Force, and this is his uh, this is Quartz, his favorite. Man. I think it's it's the, it's it's the mark of the true watch nerd when you've gone mm. through court snobbery and come out the other side. Yeah, you, you've got the confidence yeah. to, uh, to to run the quartz. So, yeah. yeah, maybe I need a quartz watch in twenty twenty two. You got you got, some, you got a bunch of G Shocks. You would have worn them a bit this year. Yeah, I got heaps of G. Yeah, G Shocks. Well, I think twenty twenty one the most worn watch was my Candy Pink Oyster Perpetual Rolex thirty six mil. Just comfortable, easy to wear, enough sort of personality and color that I, um, you know, it gave me a little bit of life every time I put it on. I'm also actually, I'm going to disagree with you, Andy. Mm-hmm. I haven't been with you every day, every minute, every mm-hmm. hour of last year, but I'm pretty yep. sure you would have worn the Apple Watch more. Yeah, true. True, because I would have taken it. Yeah. You double Is risk that- it all the time. Always quartz, always ticking in some form. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. Any, um, uh, End of the year reflections yeah. before we before we get into the app. Uh, I mean, uh, not really. I've just been um, watching the new Queer Eye, uh, uh-huh. which is great. Uh, Anthony's got the Amiga drip going on. That's nice. Not really. I'm not really a I'm not really a resolution reflection kind of guy. I just why are we marking these arbitrary moments? It's it's time is a continuum, Andy. It just rolls on. <laughs> is that my reflection? <laughs> What about you, Andy? Have you come to any uh, deep realizations about yourself? Yeah, I think I have. I think it's time to level up oh, in shit. sort of the the watch tier that I'm in, or stop. It's. <gasps> Why are you telling this to me now when we're recording, Andy? You could have. <laughs> this seems like a conversation we should have had as like some sort of mediated affair. Interesting. What do you so so you level up like get a Patek or something or yeah or dot, just or. I mean, I'm at the point where you know you kind of have, you know, it's you know it's a slippery slope, right? You spend mm. one grand on you know a watch, and then you you buy a couple of grand watches, and then you have five grand watch, and then you're like, well, I've got three watches that equal five k. Why don't I just buy that, like that tutor for five k? Yeah, 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 I gotcha, I gotcha. And so I feel like I'm at that point in the you know where it's kind of like, well, how many more you know watches Still, at this price yeah, point I'm going to sure. add before it's and I have too many watches to wear, so it's like, well, why don't I just sell ten and by one or not even sell but just not kind of take those the mid-level and just Mm. just save for something bigger like make it more of a a thing um that's that's where i'm at or precious metal maybe Maybe yeah i can see you like i think gold i think a um a day date or something like that is in your future Mm. yeah 
That'd be nice. I can see that. I can. I, I, that makes sense. Maybe like a gold Cartier. We've been talking a bit about how you don't have. Yeah, a precious watch. metal. I just feel like I have so many steel watches. It doesn't yeah. have to be a crazy expensive precious metal. Maybe vintage. Uh, yeah, get or, a JLC reversal or something nice like that. Yeah, just just something a bit more. You would know. you start with two tone, or would you go go all in? See, I don't know if I want to mess around with two tone. I do love yeah. some two tone watches, but I don't know if I want to mess around. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, a good call. And again, just to bring it back to Anthony Onguiro, he was wearing the mm. uh, that moonshine gold, the Apollo uh, oh, wow. uh, limited edition with the red bezel. Poor, oh, look good. That watch, man, that came out and it wasn't, that was to me like the tipping point of Omega Hype when it went really crazy because it wasn't, it wasn't super hot. And then as they started to get delivered, it was almost like something happened overnight and you just couldn't get them. Well, and, I remember, again, this is, you know, we're, we're diverging, but like I remember, uh, I think it was a guy, one of the guys from Oscar Hunt, mm. he was like messaging me like, whoa, it would have be been like 2016. Yeah. And there was one selling in Australia, like one of the original ones. Mm. And he's like, he was, it was at an auction house, like a, a small Aussie auction house. And he's like, oh, should I do it? Should I do it? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's pretty good. Great watch, you know. I mean, go like you know, probably around 20 grand watch, la, la, la. And I look back at that now and I'm like, man, that would have been such a buy. Yeah, I mean, that was like 30K because yeah. they, you almost get a discount on it. And then now, now, I mean, you know, some certain Omegas are crazy, but that's just one where I think I think we slept on that. Everyone slept on that watch. I and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I yeah, 100%. I remember being in my first Basel, I think we were at, at the Omega booth. Um, and you, you got to go upstairs with someone very important. And he showed you all those precious metal pieces. He didn't show you like some platinum. Yeah, that was a, as well. Um, that was a really genius. So this is uh, uh, Reinhold Eichelman, the CEO. Yeah, this is an example of incredible boss stuff. He saw like three media guys hanging around just waiting for an appointment, and he's like, "Yeah, what, what, what are you guys doing now?" And I'm like, "Oh, we just got half an hour to kill." And he's like, "Ah," and he took me and the cameraman. He just said, "Go upstairs, like into a, a different office," and said, "Have a look at these," and like that was. Hundred percent, he doesn't care what about my life or recognize that I want to see these precious metal speedmasters like with yeah. baguette hour markers. But he's gone. These guys have a camera gear and aren't doing anything for half an hour. I'm going to get them working for me. That was, and I just thought about that afterwards. Like, obviously, I was like losing my shit for the watches, but afterwards, I'm like, that is such a such a boss move. I, like, like, I, and I, I felt like I was. it was a special thing at the time. Like I felt like it was. Oh, dude, I think I went to the bathroom and you. <laughs> when I came back out, I'm like, where's Felix? You're upstairs. You came down like, show me all this stuff on your phone. And then I'm like, oh, can we see it? Can we see it? And then we had an appointment with Omega and they showed us some cool stuff, whatever. But they didn't have those. And I was just, I remember being so salty that you got to go out and see it because uh, I like we, there wasn't much coverage. Like they really didn't yeah. show those watches to many well, people. I mean, they, and they do it at Rolex as well. Like they do it with, um, if they've got time, like they pull out that special custom the stuff. That, you know, the special order things. That they, because there's no point mm. to show that to the market. Yeah. Because they're not going to get it. it. I mean, but honestly, Andy, um, Basel was a high sodium diet a lot of the time. So you <laughs> should get used to that. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, Rolex though, mm. let's, get, uh, let's get back to James Cox. James Cox, great to great to have you on uh, on the show. How are you how are you kind of going over there in LA? Uh, I'm doing great, Andy. I really appreciate you reaching out and uh, excited to have a conversation with you today. Doing pretty well. I'm here. Uh, I'm actually up in uh, Santa Cruz, which is north okay. of LA, coastal California, little little surf town. Um, kind of reminds me of like maybe like when I visited Fremantle uh, years ago. Ah. I think that's the. It has. Uh, I guess that was back in the eighties when I was in Fremantle and back then, um, you know, all getting painted up and polished up for the, uh, the pending America's cup race that was happening that, that, uh, summer I was there. Oh, very um, cool. So Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz has that feel just to give the, give the perspective. It's, you know, it's a California version, a little overcrowded, a little too expensive. Um, but the beer is good and the surf is good. <laughs> nice. Uh, what else could yeah. you want? We see, we do see a lot of Santa Cruz uh, surfwear kicking around here. It's it's very famous, uh, f- famous sure. to see. Um, well, yeah, James, we've obviously for- got you on the show to kind of hear hear a bit about your story. It's probably the most, I guess, I think it's the story of the most important watch in the history of watches. And um, people can correct me if they're wrong, but 
James, you once uh, you once owned Paul Newman's Daytona uh, and very famously auctioned it off. I think it was 2017. I'd, I'd love to kind of hear your take on sort of that watch and, and that journey and, and maybe if we start, you know, with the story that I'm sure you've told a million times, but how you ended up with, with that watch. That's great, um, Andy. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll flash back for a moment because it is a it is kind of a beautiful story, and people always find it interesting that I've had such an iconic watch for so many years without knowing how iconic it it was. And of course, it didn't necessarily start off that way. Um, so mm-hmm. you know, back in the back in the eighties, um, in college, I met this super rum, rambunctious hot blonde. <laughs> I was standing in my parking lot of my School is my first year at university, and this Nissan Stanza car comes in the driveway, and it's a gravel driveway, and then hits the U brake and spins the car around into a spot. And this hot headed blonde gets out with a six pack of beer and marches past me, like, Who are you looking at? (laughs) And I was like, Wow, that girl is hot. And um, that I was fixated on her. And at the time it was interesting. That was Paul Newman's daughter, but she did not go by that name in college. She Ah. chose a different name to remain anonymous. And um, clearly I I didn't at the time know who who her family was, nor did I care being a young college guy. She had a, she had a nice car and she always had beer. I was like, okay, that's my (laughs) girl and uh, pursued her. And sure enough, we ended up hitting it off and started and we're actually dating before I, I figured out her family. So that was great because what that did for her, as you can imagine, as a, a child of a famous person, and, and Paul Newman, of course, was extremely famous during her childhood. Mm. Um, you know, she always described it as life in a fishbowl where everybody's okay. looking in at you. And I'm sure it's not as uh, difficult as actually being Paul Newman, but it, but it's a tough tough place to, to be as a, a child of a famous person. So mm. she did her best to remain anonymous. And that was great because I clearly um, was after her for other reasons. <laughs> and uh, mm. we ended up actually um, dating for 10 years from that, uh, that summer on. Wow. So it was a really great, great relationship. But, but the way I came about the watch is, uh, you know, I, during one summer I was back visiting her family and they were in Connecticut and, uh, During the summers, I would just do various trades to save money for college. And they had an old tree house uh, on their property that had fallen down. And I decided that I would rebuild that as one of my summer projects and and quite an elaborate tree house. This was a big oak tree hanging over a a small river. Okay. It was 10 by 10 with, you know, pointed ceiling and shingles and just a gorgeous tree house. And the, the Newmans owned a house on each side of this river and there was a small bridge across it where I was building the treehouse. And and in the afternoons of this summer, uh, uh, Paul Newman, who would be at one of the houses and I at the other, we ended up being yeah, alone yeah. in these houses. Like the whole rest of the family was gone that summer. His wife, Joanne Wibbard, who everybody knows, very fantastic actress and yeah. Academy Award winner, wonderful woman. Um, she was gone doing a, a live theater that summer. His other five daughters were all spread out around the country. It was just uh, Paul and I in these two different houses. And we would meet up in the afternoon. He'd come over and check out my progress on the treehouse, and often have in tow somebody else, whether it's, you know, Martin Scorsese or whomever. And as an 18 year old, that's crazy, pretty ignorant college boy. I had no idea who these people were. (laughs) They were all super cool, but you know, I was not a star struck kid. But it was kind of neat because he'd come over and check check out my progress and invite me back for some leftovers. And uh, and then this one one day he came over, and I, I honestly don't know to this day. I assume it was premeditated and not maybe that spontaneous. But he come, came over and he asked me what time it was. Oh, yeah, and, goosebumps. Um, and, I, yeah, and I said, Paul, I, I said, I don't know. I don't have the time. And he was, and he was trying to wind his watch, which he'd forgotten to wind, and he took it off his wrist and said, well, here, if you wind this thing, it'll, it'll keep pretty good time. And he hands me this Rolex. And that was kind of towards the end of the summer. And we had already kind of bonded pretty well. And so imagine this, you know, here I'm 18 years old, my girlfriend's dad, uh, already awkward enough. Um, and, but he also happens to be Paul Newman and um, hands me this thing. And I'm like, wow. I mean, I was smart enough at the time to know that a Rolex was an important timepiece but how cool is that you know she he's giving me this watch 
And so I wore it the rest of that summer, winding it. Um, he showed me how to wind it at the time. Um, and then he walked off that night. And um, that was kind of, he didn't make a big deal about it. Um, and I wore it for the next, you know, 20 some odd years, pretty much every day. And I coveted it because primarily it was a gift from this super cool guy. And it wasn't until the 90s at a trade show in Salt Lake City. And I was there for one of my business events, international trade show. And a Japanese businessman who didn't speak very much, barely any English, notices the Rolex on my arm and points to it and says, Paul Newman watch, Paul Newman watch. And I look at him like, how does this guy know that I've got Paul Newman's watch? It's just like, what is going on here? And I just kind of, he, the guy walked away and I just kind of tucked that away in my mind, think what an unusual thing. Um, and then did a little research and found out, well, indeed, you know, Paul wearing this watch had kind of made this watch, particular watch synonymous with with uh, with him. But of course, that was the 90s, still not seriously on my radar that this had as much gravity as it did. Um, so again, I kept wearing it for quite a few years. When Paul died in 2008, a couple people had inquired with the family as to where Paul's Rolex had gone, and they that led them back to me. And somebody at that time reached out and offered me like a million dollars for the watch. And it was at yeah, that right. point I realized the watch had some some power. Um, of course, I declined. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and then a few other little weird things happened. I remember I walked by a Rolex dealer in Monterey, California, and they had a couple Paul Newman Daytona watches in the window, and I recognized it and. And there's a, a Rolex guy standing outside smoking a cigarette. He's got his white coat on that says Rolex. And I just pointed to the watch and said, hey, you know, what's retail on some of those watches? And he says, oh, you know, about 70, 150,000. We have a couple other Paul Newmans in the back. And I was like, wow, Paul Newmans. He's calling it the Paul Newman watch. And that was like my other wow. clue. And then, and then as it happened, every year after 2008, I'd get a call from somebody kind of tracking it down, usually the, the, the same gentleman offering me like another million. <laughs> you know, how about two million? <laughs> nope, nope. And then, uh, and then I decided to put the watch away in a safe deposit box, realizing it had quite a bit of value. And, uh, and it pretty much just sat there for, for quite a while. I think that, you know, losing Paul and helping the family grapple with that and just... Uh, you know, it was a tr tremendous loss. I'd spent so many years with his family and with him, and he was just a super important person in my life. And I had this connection to him in this watch. But fast forward, you know, I realized this thing's in a safe deposit box, and I, it was occurring to me how valuable it potentially was. And I, and I just said, you know, if Paul was alive and I went to him and said, Paul, that watch you gave me, it turns out it's extremely important uh, and extremely valuable. Um, the first thing he would say was, you know, well, kid, what are you going to do? You're not just going to sit on it, are you? Um, and I think he would, you know, would have supported pulling it back out and, uh, and doing something and good with it. Um, and so, you know, so that was kind of my, my thinking at the time. And I checked in with the family and they kind of agreed with my, my thinking. And then uh, again, long story longer, um, calling a, a few friends of mine in, in the watch world, um, um, got connected with, uh, a, a rel from, from Phillips, mm -hmm. who most of your listeners probably know. Definitely. And, uh, yeah. And that part of the story is kind of fun too. I mean, my friend had, had been working with Arel, uh, had a couple of, uh, some, some cool, uh, Patek Philippe watches that I think were Eric Clapton's watches that he was discussing with Phillips to, to bring to auction. And, um, so my friend asked me, he says, hey, do you mind if I call my, my friend Aurel in Switzerland and tell him about your watch? I'm like, no, 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 go ahead. And this is when he and I are both in L.A. So I guess he gets on the phone and calls Aurel and says, I've got, you know, my buddy James here and he's got the Paul Newman watch. And Aurel, of course, pauses and he's like, <laughs> a Paul Newman watch? He's like, no, 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 he's got the Paul Newman watch. And there's like a big pause on the phone. And Aurel basically says, like, is James going to stick around for a couple of days? And. My buddy puts the phone yeah. down and says, James, you're going to stick around for a few days? Like, yeah, I think I'm here for, he's like, okay, tell him not to go anywhere. And like pretty much <laughs> instantly Aurel arranges to come out to California wow. Yeah, and, uh, you know, kind of drops everything. And, um, so again, we, we set up a dinner, Aurel's coming to town. 
Um, we're going to go meet, see the watch the next day after the dinner. Arel flies in, and that's the first time I met him. And he shows up as, you know, most uh, nice Swiss guys, all in a nice suit. We're all in California attire. We're at a very nice dinner. And I'm wearing the, I'm wearing the watch. I decided to wear it to dinner the night before. But Arel doesn't think he's going to see the watch until the yeah, next okay. day, of course. He's like, oh, it must be at the office in a safe or something, you know? So we're <laughs> sitting at dinner the, with uh, my two good buddies and Aurel. He's pretty much just off the plane. And I just kind of let, you know, the appetizers are out. I just kind of let the watch poke out of my sleeve and just to see if Aurel notices. And he looks over and he literally like almost drops his fork and goes, <laughs> you're wearing it? And I'm like, yeah, I'm wearing it. And then he kind of like, pauses and looks at me and my friend says, James, a gentleman would let him see the watch. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So Aurel like, Aurel like grabs his plate, slides it out of the way and looks at me. And I pull the watch off and hand it to him. And sure enough, Aurel whips a loop out of his pocket and of he's just onto the watch. And we really don't hear much from him for the next like six minutes. He's like mumbling, he's like, yep, mm-hmm, yep. Oh, oh, to dial this. And he's like mumbling and like going over all these little things in his mind. And then he stops and he's like, I've been thinking about this watch for so many years huh. and to have it now and to be able to confirm this and that and look at the patina and see that the, you know, it doesn't look like the watch was ever updated and it's wonderfully aged. And he's just, is the happiest you, you know, like I've seen anybody in years. He's yeah. just so happy. And, um, and that was just really fun. And then, so we arrange, of course, to, to meet the next day. And, uh, and that was kind of bittersweet. I mean, I, I learned a lot more about the watch with Aurel and the next day Aurel says, Hey, you know, um, may I take this back to Switzerland with me? And I was like, Oh gosh, I've got to part with this thing. And yeah. getting real. a couple of the, a couple of the, yeah. And a couple of the other watches that also were extremely interesting watches. I think, like I said, they were Eric Clapton's Patek Philippe's that were going back with Aurel and, um, so I'm in my, my friend's office with Aurel and we're in this fancy office in LA and Aurel has kind of assumed he's going to be able to take my watch. And so sure enough, I, I'm, you know, my, with my friend's blessing, he's like, this is going to be fine. We trust Aurel. Sure enough, like the, the armored car literally shows up with these guys that get out bags and we put my watch in this thing and it goes by armored car to, to the yeah. airport and it's all insured. And uh, so this is all new to me. And it felt like a you know crazy James Bond. Movie. And then, uh, you know, the watch is off in, in Switzerland and Aurel is checking it out. And, and the good news for everyone is that the watch wasn't messed with. I literally put it on my wrist in the 80s, um, wore it. I mean, I did a lot of construction to get myself through college. And I just I wore that thing every day and I beat the heck out of it. And it just continued to perform flawlessly. Never broke it. No new bezels. No new nothing. I mean, a new a new band at one point because that had rotted. Mm. But but it just goes to show how well that thing that was such a workhorse. Can I ask James um, what when you sort of met Orel for the first time? How far out from that was that from the auction? Um, that was oh boy, at least a year and a half, if 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 not two. Yeah. God. Yeah, there was a big a big bunch of time there, and there was no commitments made at that evening it was simply uh you know Aurel was happier than he'd ever been in his life it seemed and he, you know letting it go back to with him and get authenticated and checked out was seemed like a fine thing to do but they the, the folks at Phillips Aurel were just so amazing there was absolutely zero pressure uh for me to do anything and they let me make my decisions in time and and that's when it started to get real for me and and you know and we got together with the team at Phillips and we said you know for me, this is about a lot of things. I mean, there, there's the my new exposure to the watch community was like, wow, if this thing is in, is as important as it is to collectors, yeah. and if people out there are that excited, you know, how fun would it be to let them all have a look at it? Some of them to wear it, some of them to find out more about this thing. I mean, at this point, I'd learned more. Like my the watch had its own Wikipedia page, and <laughs> you know, and people were telling me this is the holy grail of watches. It's the most Im- interesting and significant of the Rolexes. And as I met more and more watch collectors, I'm like, these guys are cool. I mean, they're a wacky bunch. All you guys are a little <laughs> wacky, but 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 sure. you're neat. And I mean, I, I was not a watch collector, but I'm I'm into nice cars, and I appreciate well made things, and I've had many businesses and I've really focused on, you know, design and well-made stuff. I mean, it's right up my wheelhouse. I should have been a watch Mm. collector. (laughs) Um, So part of it was like, 
wow, we should take this thing on tour. And I didn't know at the time that's what's done typically of uh, vintage watches auction. on auction before they yeah. go to auction. Yeah, they go around the world and people get to see. But but that was like, wow, we should do this and we should let as many people get their, a chance to check out this watch. And so along those lines, when we went on tour with the watch, we made sure that um, it was as, as accessible as possible. And uh, Arel and uh, Paul Boutros from Philips had arranged to have this cool device that the watch could be mounted on out in the open, not behind glass, uh, on a stand. And it was such that if you tried to grab it, it would disappear down yep. into the mm-hmm. stand. And and it's, you can Google it and see it's a super slick thing. But that mm-hmm. was kind of fun, too. Like, the watch is actually going to be out there for people to to get that close to. And, of course, there are certain people that reached out to me. And I'm like... Uh, you know, the, 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 the writer, Michael uh, Caruso from uh, Wall Street Journal, mm-hmm. who was mm-hmm. in Europe at the time. And I said, you know, you need to, if you're going to write about this watch, you need to put it on. You know, it's in a vault at Phillips. Go to Geneva, get a bottle of wine and a nice cigar. Go down in that vault and pop the wine. Put this thing on your wrist, you know, and, and have that experience. Um, because this watch, and this sounds a little funny, but it, the watch had a vibe to it. And, uh, you know, it sounds touchy feely, but like Paul Newman wore this watch for years, you know, Mm. he wore it on movie sets. He wore it racing cars and he got into racing late in life. And, Mm. you know, it's a, it, he just, it was just amazing that he had an ability to get into that, to racing and to do so well. Mm. And it's, it's something that he loved so much because everything else in his life was so, uh, I mean, he was he was famous, yes, but he would say it was about luck, and he would say it's because you know what if I was born with brown eyes, uh, what if <laughs> I was born in hung wow. in Hungary, you know, and he had this humility, and I think honestly the racing to him was the one place it was he could truly, it was just his actual abilities, you know, I mean sure he had good cars, but so did other people. But he mm. was a good racer, and he worked hard at it. He was a shitty racer when he started, apparently. Um, but he was good, and he worked hard at it. And I think that was just such an important part of his career. So this watch was used for the purpose that it was designed back then. I mean, it was literally used for for timing and lap keeping. And whenever he raced in his early days, he made sure it was visible on his sleeve. And that's kind of unimaginable now to younger people to think that you'd use an actual stopwatch, but that's how they did it. And sometimes even he would take the watch off if there wasn't a handy stopwatch, like at Lime Rock, Connecticut, you know, if he's just there on a weekend doing some laps, he would actually take it off and hand it to uh, one of his daughters or somebody to do the timing from the Mm. pits. So the watch that I had, was super authentic in that way and it wasn't a trophy watch uh and he didn't have you know he didn't collect watches he had this watch because it was a tool and again back to the original story Mm. he got the watch from his wife joanne woodward and it's right about when paul started racing cars after the movie that um, they did called winning and Mm. she lovingly inscribes on the back of this drive carefully me and gives them this watch and it's uh we're pretty sure she bought it at uh, tiffany's in new york city That's and right. so at the time you know this wasn't an expensive watch i don't think they were selling well back then that would have been in definitely the not 70s yeah and so again it was for him it was a loving gift uh it was inscribed and it was a tool and it and, and a lot of you know your listeners know the story more than i about why it became so cool and iconic um but for me obviously very personal very uh one of the most personal things in the family and a super good connection with paul and i um and i i really feel that when we decided to take it to auction it was you know the one reason again as i said to to share it to let the story of the watch come out and bring that excitement but more importantly was to bring the story of Paul Newman back out. It had been several years since he passed away. And Mm. 
Um, the reason the watch is famous is because the guy was super cool and he really was that cool. Uh, I mean, he was a superstar, but such a humble man and so generous. And, you know, he starts a, a food company as a joke with salad dressing and realizes <laughs> that it's going to be super successful and decides to give all the money to charity. Oh, and, how good. You know, and that, that, and, and that, those products sell in Australia as well. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There. Yeah. And a lot of funding at the time went to different groups in Australia. Um, so, I mean, that's just unprecedented, right? And, and many businesses through since then have, have picked up that, that charm. And, and Paul used to say, one of my favorite quotes was that, you know, if, if people knew how good it felt to give their money away, they wouldn't wait till they're dead to do it. And he really lived that way. And that's, again, his, uh, the stuff I learned from Paul was like, you know, this watch cannot stay in a safe deposit box. Um, it's obviously, mm. I, I don't want to risk wearing it anymore. And let's take that imbibed energy, that history, that magic. Let's bring it to the world. Let's celebrate Paul Newman. Let's celebrate the watch. And then if we have a windfall, let's do something super cool. And that's where we are. Yeah. So um, you, you sort of all touched on the question that I was going to ask um, just then, James. Was there any, and you've sort of spoken about how you gradually, over the course of years and years, realized that this watch was something special. And after um, Paul Newman passed away, that you sort of put it away somewhere safe. Was there any point where it started, uh, where you stressed out about it, or you started to feel like it was a, a burden, or you, you know, you realized that the weight of your possessions was sort of holding holding you back, maybe? Well, that's an interesting question. It, I, I never felt a burden. I was definitely nervous mm. um, about it. I think, again, the, you know, Paul was such a father figure to me. And, um, I, you know, as a young kid, I mean, I met him when I was 18 years old and, um, you know, felt formative. like, I, yeah, it was a real formative time. And, and we had this funny relationship because he was way more available to me than I recognized at the time. Mm. And I think I was overly careful to honor his privacy because mm. I uh, would watch him in public places and watch how many people wanted something from him. And I think one of the reasons he appreciated me is that, you know, I wasn't starstruck and I did go out of my way to, to opt to give him uh, his privacy. But I, I, that's the one thing in life I regret is that he was right there he was trying to connect with me more and mm -hmm. I, you know, overcompensated to give him his privacy and didn't take that opportunity. It's really my only regret and gestures like handing me the watch was significant. Of course, at the time, you must remember, yeah, yeah. He's, he's giving me something that is super cool, but it's, he, he, you know, obviously he doesn't realize the watch is a famous iconic piece, at no, that point. Yeah. even though it, it, I'm sure it had traction but not on his radar. And he was not a man. He didn't collect things. He didn't keep cars and trophies. And he did not, he really had his priorities straight. Um, he was about family, dignity, honor, um, always really thinking, um, you know, as I look back, he was just a really smart guy. And, and we did have very tender moments and good connections, but I, He'd often invite me places, and I'd decline, thinking that he wasn't a genuine offer. And <laughs> uh, and one, one, I think it was one night when he came over to visit me at the treehouse, and he introduced me to somebody as family. And I said, "Well, you know, sort of family." And I and he came back like two days later and said, "You know, I I didn't mean to offend you by calling you family." And that's the kind of guy he was. Like, yeah. he's a superstar, and he's got this eighteen-year-old kid who's just, you know, dating his daughter. And he's sensitive enough to think on that, that he said something that might have offended me. And how could you be offended with Paul Newman saying your family? And of course I wasn't offended. I just was embarrassed or whatever it was, trying not to. But that's the kind of guy he was. Like two days later to remember that and make an effort to, to say something to me. Just so amazingly aware, but mm. not of the trappings. And so again, back to your 
your question about things, I think that that's the stuff I learned from him is not to, you know, have these possessions and be weighted down or try and keep your eye on, on the prize, which is, you know, doing good and communicating and valuing family and friendship, those sort of things. And also I was just broke my whole life. So it's not like I had, was able to accumulate things, but, but again, I felt like this wasn't in some ways it wasn't my watch. It was really like I was a steward to kind of take care of this watch Mm. and feeling that if other family members had had it, they may not have treated it the same way. Um, And at the time I did feel like family. I mean, I spent 10 years with that family and I'm still connected with them. I mean, I I broke up with Nell, uh, his daughter, but we remained steady friends. And to this day, I mean, I, I saw her last Friday, I'm seeing her this Friday. Uh, her husband is, uh, you know, I was the photographer at the wedding. I'm super tight. And I run her, uh, I'm the treasurer of her private foundation, which fast forward is now uh, the vehicle for which we're using to take those funds from the sale and carry this magic and momentum forward. So uh, that's a very long answer to your question. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the burden was more nervousness about am I yeah. doing the right thing? And am I going to honor Paul with this? And, you know, people say, oh, you must have felt like you won the lottery or something. It's like, no, I, I think we did a very smart and careful dance. We were very patient. And, mm. and luckily, I had the very good guidance of Paul Boutros and Aurel Box from, and, and, and their team from Phillips. Mm. These, are, these are good people. They're very caring. Um, they they be, became quick friends and I trusted them and they trusted me. And it was just like they understood what was important and they would make the effort. They, they helped me do things that were unnecessary to probably have a good auction. For example, I said, you know, when we show the watch, it needs to be emotional. It needs to be about Paul. And let's, you know, and I think this was one of even RL's ideal, you know, let's get a race car. Let's get one of Paul's race cars and have it next to the watch because that is emotional. And we did things like that. You know, we, we found did. his race cars and we'd have them shipped from California to New York and they'd yeah, wow. literally pull the, pull the glass off the walls of the Phillips auction house and crane the damn car in so that you'd walk into this room and you'd see the car and the racing suit and the watch and just wow. the emotion of it. And then we, you know, Nell, uh, Nell and I, we send letters to Paul's friends like Mario Andretti, who luckily came out for the, for the night. And we had this beautiful night before the auction where um, we got to tell stories about Paul and to a full house of you know, several hundred people. And as I say, this was for me personally, it was much more about the story mm. and the watch being a symbol and reminding everybody like, hey, the reason this watch is cool Sure, it's a handsome watch, and it delivered on its promise. But but it's cool because Paul Newman made it cool. And you can say, you know, Jacques Cousteau wore watches that have purpose and function in history. But for some reason, this dude just, just stood out. And that's what uh, was important to me. And once I knew we were doing that, I felt good about it. And then the fate was in the hands of, of you know, of time and, and history. Um, yeah. And, you know, and we, we did, we brought, you know, Mario Andretti got up there on the stage and, and another kind of fun, cool story is that the night we're going to go talk about Paul, um, I go to my closet and I pull out a tuxedo that, uh, Paul had given me, um, oh, no and actually correctly, you know, you know, Joanne had given it to me, his wife, Joanne gave it to me because Paul was hoping to never wear tuxedos ever again at the time. <laughs> and it's the same tuxedo he wore. I think the last, he wore it. He wore it at the Oscars when he got his Oscar with with Tom Cruise. And I Googled that and I could see the tuxedo there. Like, yep, that's the same tuxedo. And then apparently he wore it at one other night because I, I, I put it on. It fits me perfectly. Luckily, I was I fit all his clothes perfectly except his wow. shoes. <laughs> so I have some good hand-me-downs. So, so I decided I'm going to wear his tuxedo the night before the auction. And I'm going to wear it the night I'm going to talk about Paul. And I didn't mention this that night because it seemed creepy. But I reach in the pocket of the tuxedo and I pull out a a theater stub from a theater uh, in New York 
and it's and this again sounds i mean i can i'll send you a photo of it because it's almost yeah, unbelievable do. i pull this ticket stub out and it's the the name of the play is called reckoning the estate and Whoa. it's got paul newman's name on it it was a comped ticket and it's the it's it it was a couple like i can't remember how many years before it's the same date like six or seven years before. I mean, you just couldn't make this shit up. Wow. It's the same wow. night in New York City. It's called Reckoning the Estate. And I put that thing, it's still in the tuxedo up in my closet right now because I put it back in that pocket. And I showed it to his daughter, Nell, and she like looked at me like, that is the weirdest damn thing. But I don't think I showed it to you that night. It just seemed too strange spooky. to be true, right? Isn't it spooky? And cool. yeah. so anyway, so that night was gorgeous. And it was pretty scripted. And then all of a sudden I just got motivated and I stood up and kind of broke script. I mean, well, I'm not joking that it was scripted, but it felt kind of like a, an old newscast thing. And I just got up and looked at everybody out there and said similar things to what I'm saying right now. Like, you know, we're here because Paul Newman was super cool and let's honor him. And um, I think I did mention that I was wearing his tuxedo and that was kind of corny, yep. but cute. Um, but it was just gorgeous. It was just a gorgeous gorgeous thing fantastic that is that's just an incredible <laughs> tale I um yeah like i say man, a short make a longer story longer no no no. i mean this is a, a big part of the reason we wanted to to get you on was because i don't think anyone sort of really heard outside of that evening uh your account of ownership told by you uh in this sort of medium but I guess what happened afterwards was the uh, the massive auction result, and and certainly I I remember where I was. It was it was sort of for the watch world. Uh, where were you when the Paul Newman uh, Paul Newman was was <laughs> was sold? And I remember obviously it was about midday here. I was in the afternoon. Uh, I was in, in in the office at work, and kind of everyone that knew I was into watches was like, "Oh, have you heard about this watch? Have you heard about this watch?" But what I'd, I'd I'd love to hear kind of your take on what you were expecting, and obviously it was marketed for a very long time, but what were you sort of expecting it to go for? You'd had those million dollar, million dollar plus offers, but for it to sort of hammer, I think, you know, it was 15 and a half million US dollars with buyer's fees. It was the most expensive wristwatch ever sold until um, I think last year, but kind of what were you expecting? And then what happened once, you know, that hammer kind of fell and it was sold? Well, I think my expectations, I mean, I mean, it was hard to guess. And I, I kind of thought it might hit five, six million, yep. maybe. That seemed like a reasonable amount. And of course, the great friends that at Phillips said they were very wise and to never tell me what they thought, um, <laughs> despite we becoming very close friends. We just really didn't know. And we didn't, you know, the main thing at that point was we didn't want to embarrass ourselves. I wanted to make a good show of it for everybody who had worked so hard. And I think that was my first relief. It wasn't so much like, oh my goodness, we've made a lot of money. It was looking around at the Phillips people and go, wow, we worked really hard and you guys should all be very, very proud. And we had a big celebration that night. And because uh, people, you know, all those folks, so many folks work so hard at, at this. And so the joy of that, of like, yes, we were correct that this was as amazing a thing. And the world has spoken. And indeed, it's amazing. So and then the next day, uh, we, we partied hard that night. I think I, I took everybody, the whole Phillips crew out, found find a, a Thursday night in New York City, find a bar at midnight that would take, you know, 20 people from Switzerland that want to drink champagne. And uh, <laughs> so we had a nice a celebration. Uh, and the next day, I, I left my hotel and I walked from uh, down, I, I mean, I, I probably, I think I walked 70 blocks to pay a visit to Joanne Woodward, who was mm -hmm. in her apartment uh, uh, up in Upper East Side in, in Manhattan, and she did not attend um, the auction. She is um, frail and, and uh, fighting uh, Alzheimer's and having some, mm -hmm. some issues, but um, I felt like I needed to go just see her. So I, I spent, it took a long time to walk and I walked in my terribly uncomfortable shoes that pretty much the same outfit from the night before, mm -hmm. um, a little hungover from champagne and also with this incredible buzz of like, oh my God, we just did this, had this amazing auction. It was all very surreal. So I just walked, took my time, walked through Central Park, walked through the city blocks and went and sat with Joanne 
and told her what had happened and um, just sat with her and shared the beautiful story and, and recounted. And of course, wow. it, 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 she was not able to really respond, but she's such a beautiful woman. And she sat there and she smiled and, you know, it was just a beautiful time to be with her and felt so good to me to, you know, she was the most important th- person in the world to Paul Newman. Mm. They had such a beautiful marriage and um, to go be with her that soon after this event and just tell her how I felt and express th- that. Cause this gift was from her to Paul. Yeah. So, so kind of her, you know, unwillingly perhaps to participate in this. Um It was just a beautiful day for me. And, uh, you know, again, as I say, I felt like a a steward of this thing. It wasn't like, oh, cool, we hit the jackpot. It was, oh, cool, we did a great job. And now we have some resources to honor uh, the values that Paul embodied that, again, made the watch so, so awesome. Um, so, so big, big day. <laughs> it was a big yeah. day. <laughs> Very big day. That's, that's just, in, it's incredible, isn't it? I think if you, it's an amazing story to kind of, to hear and you can lengthen it, you can simplify it, but it's, it's, I think, and Felix might agree, but it's, it's sort of one of those magical stories that kind of keeps, certainly keeps me interested in, um, in the whole watch kind of world. Um, it's, it, it, it's funny. I agree. It's, it's in one ways, it's all sort of very, surreal and unimaginable for most people but it's but on the other hand it is it's relatable like um you know that it's not you know your your in-laws giving you a watch and wearing it and those are relatable things that lots of people have mm. uh, you know can tie it's like their own experience to but the the magic factor is that that you happen to be the 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 18 year old that was was yeah. dating paul newman's daughter and everything that's happened since it's 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 really quite a special story to hear so thank you for sharing that i i did yeah, have yeah, i had right. another quick question james um yeah. do, you, do you do you miss the watch at all yes yes i do and i'm actually looking at i have a copy of Houdinki in front of me and i've got it open mm-hmm. to the watch right now and mm-hmm. i look at it and it does bring up some emotion i i do miss it um you know i just just another thing on that earlier point that i think yep. When people hear this and they say, oh, you know, how lucky you did, you know, I I was involved in a neat family and they passed this heirloom along. But, you know, all of us in the watch world um, have the opportunity to choose a watch and and if it's not already special, make it special and pass it on to family and people we love. And and I think that watches have that factor and maybe my story can help make it more so. I mean, since then, I've Mm -hmm. met people and I've said, you know is your daughter into that watch? And they'll be like, well, yeah, she's got her eye on it. It's kind of cool. It's like, well, go put something sweet on the back of it for her, you know, buy her another yeah, back yeah. if you need to, in case she wants to take it off. But I, I, I think that, you know, this, this is accessible. And again, that's what it is. Paul, yes, Paul Newman's famous, but the, the way he rolled through life, we can all emulate. Hmm. And you don't have to be famous to be generous and you don't have to be famous to be honorable. And we can all, jump right in this and those of us that have cool watches can do cool things with them and it's at a different scale perhaps but um i i just think that the watches symbolically and the, the you know the size of them the fun they're just the perfect thing for this type of behavior you know and yeah. um you know and and since then i've tried to encourage more philanthropy in the watch world. I kind of naively was hoping that, you know, Rolex would get all excited about this. And again, this is before I kind of learned more about how the vintage world is so different than the, you know, the, the more modern watches and that sort of thing. And this is my naivety about the whole industry, but I'm like, you know, we need to, you know, let's get some other watches and let's put them on some cool people and let's, Mm. you know, get those people doing cool things and then let's auction them off and put the money back in and let's rinse and repeat. I mean, how many people might think it's fun to have a a watch that Leonardo DiCaprio wore for a year and he did some cool shit with it. And I'm like, great, I'll go fund a cool project to work on, you know, some climate issue in 
you know, in the north of Australia and we'll get some cool people to get involved and then we'll auction those watches off and, and play it forward. And um, that idea hasn't quite taken shape, but it's not too late. It's not too late. Um, and yeah. and you haven't, uh, you haven't uh, wasted those funds. You've, you've been putting them to work. So obviously the, the auction was massive and, and needed a, a huge amount of money. And I know that the intention was to sort of um, – give some money to the Newman's foundation, but also you started your own, uh, I guess it's a charitable organization as well. My friend, James, what sort of work have you been doing there? What sort of, how have you put this all to, to, to work and, and what's the mission? Yeah. Well, the, the mission is largely centered around climate related issues and organic agriculture. And, you know, I just joke, I'm just trying to save the world. It's not too big an effort, but, um, I, I've been involved in various philanthropic efforts through the through the Newman family. Um, mm-hmm. you know, as, as Paul's salad dressing company, uh, he each year would have a certain amount of money that he would let his daughters allocate to various charities of their choice. And Nell and I were, you know, at the time we were pretty serious environmental, you know, crazy tree huggers back back in the day. And so we'd all find different environmental things. And since then, I, we've tempered a lot. And I'm yep. much more pragmatic and uh, much more about, uh, I'm a business guy and I'm about finding good solutions that are, that are practical. And, and so what I'm doing with the funds, we're basically, you know, we're, we're spending it down over many years. It's not like people mm-hmm. go, you're giving it to charity, you write one big check. It's like, no, mm-hmm. I mean, you could do that, but it's way more fun to find yep. many small charities. And I'm a marketing guy. I love business and marketing and finding good messaging. So what, what's fun is to find a small cause that I believe in and fund it, but also help uh, provide support and marketing and messaging. So one example I love is in Iceland. And I had been going to Iceland to mountain bike um, and done several you know, multi-day trips of trail running and mountain biking in the highlands of Iceland and just fell in love with that, the people and, and the countryside. And on one trip, I met, a, he's a famous heart surgeon in, in Iceland, who's a, a, also a very uh, environmental activist, a mountain climber, mm-hmm. real outdoorsman. And he and I are on a climb together in the west of, of, of Iceland. And he's pointing to this area in the west where he's like, you know, there, there's a, a big mining project and a three dams proposed in this area. And it's the largest open space in Europe currently. And it's really not a great fate for this area. And mm. And I looked at him, I said, well, we should, we should change that then if it's not good. And he's like, well, that'd be great. And he already had a lot of momentum with uh, trying to uh, bring awareness to this area. And I said, well, let me help you. I think this is a good project. And that's an example where, um, you know, I was able to go in and, and, and use good business sense, good marketing sense, and help organize a small group of people that had a, an honorable cause. And Unlike the old days where I might say, yeah, dams are no good and mines are no good. Mm-hmm. Today is more like, hey, I love aluminum. Like, let's mine aluminum, but let's do it responsibly. And let's do it where it should be done and not necessarily in the last open space in a fjord mm-hmm. in, in Iceland. That just didn't make sense. And so can we go pencil this out? Can we hire some economists to look at the impact and look at alternatives? And sure enough, with a little bit of funding, we're able to demonstrate just with really objective economics that there's a better fate that this is actually not a great future for this area Mm. and you know but not coming in and injecting our ideas but more offering this and getting the community involved and sure enough we've been working at this for a couple years uh bringing in people to map the region um talking to the locals that want the dam and finding out you know Mm -hmm. what some some farm owner like why would you want this and turns out well you know, he says the crane they use down at the dock doesn't work anymore and they need it for hauling fish. And if the dam is built, they're going to have money for the crane. And I'm like, oh, well, why don't we just fix your crane? <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of the cute stories. I talked to some local guys. I'm like, what do you guys need to fix this crane? And he's like, well, we need like a new electric motor. I'm like, where do you get it? He's like, Amazon, <laughs> like yeah. everything else. And I'm like, what's that going to cost? He's like about four grand. I'm like, oh, well, we'll give you four grand and you buy the crane and get the motor, fix the crane. And now you don't need a, a multi-billion dollar dam <laughs> to get your 
Ukraine. And it's just kind of interesting that so many things, it's like tradition unimpeded by progress, you know, why? And mm-hmm. having some resources to go in and try and unravel these these situations and go, you know, maybe the dams were the best fate for the, the West of Iceland. I didn't think so. And over, you know, a couple of years of studying it and hiring cool people to help, we've demonstrated that, hey, this isn't a great fate. In fact, we've got better ideas. And sure enough, uh, with the help of oil prices crashing and mm. the work we've done and helping landowners protect their land, uh, it, it it's pretty likely this project will not go forward. And in its place, we're probably going to help a lot of farmers and fishermen and, and, and it's, it's just cool. So that's one example. Um, yeah. You know, other things that kind of tie back more to the watch world kind of indirectly is uh, uh, Celine Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau's granddaughter has been involved yeah. in indigenous work, uh, filming in, in South America and retracing her granddaddy's footsteps. She and I got connect, connected and some of this money has helped with some of those documentaries and we've Incredible. also talked about her her granddad's Rolexes and things like that. Compared um, notes. So the money, yeah, yeah. So the money is is going to projects that I, I have my fingers in everything, and that's really exciting um, because again, I'm bringing a really practical business side to solving problems in the environment because I am one that believes that. Uh, you know, there's tons of practical ways to get herself out of this climate mess. And, uh, and I, I, it's not a, you know, a this or that. It's like we can honor the change, but we need to do this and we need to, to make good choices. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, and yeah. I have a website called myfriendjames.com, which started as a joke. Because people will be like, hey, my friend James yeah. is doing all this cool shit and he's doing this. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so let's just call it my friend James. And the little logo I came up with actually has some of uh, the, the original uh, Rolex dials in it. So it's kind of uh, my slogan for the whole thing was watch this, yep. which is kind of cute too. Like, watch this. I'm going to go do some cool shit, save the world. Yeah, we'll link that up in, <laughs> in our show notes as well. And and I, I remember when you, you launched the website, I, I think I sent it to Felix. And I said, I remember the guy who saw the, the Newman Daytona, he set up this website. And I don't think anyone's noticed, but the logo – is is a is a is a pair of watch hands and a dial and yeah I think he's I think something's happening here but yeah look we'll link that up that's amazing it's obvious that you're really passionate about you know this work uh, and you know I've spent a, a little bit of time on the website and I'll spend some more looking through at all the great projects and you know everyone encourage everyone to kind of subscribe and, and follow you guys as well to kind of keep up to date um, but. Look, James, I don't think uh, all of the money has has gone to charity. I think you've re- you've replaced the watch, and I and I saw this uh, this recently. Uh, you've replaced it. You've replaced it uh, this year, I think you said. But you obviously sold this treasured timepiece. What did you What did you wear to tide yourself over uh, until replacing it? Um, well, actually, I was fortunate enough to have access to another Paul Newman watch, but not a famous one. This one was. I believe given to Paul by Rolex at some function. Uh-huh. It was a, a GMT, and I had that on my wrist for a couple of years, and it was lovely, um, great daily, good working watch. But it, it wasn't mine, and it didn't quite have the feel I and <laughs> feel I wanted. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, what what am I going to get? Well, I want to get another Rolex because I'm, I'm loyal to the brand mm-hmm. in some ways, and so I just thought I'd get a new Daytona. And I couldn't get another vintage because, of course, nothing could replace what I had. And I'd, I'd be sad, I think, looking at any other mm. vintage <laughs> Daytona on my, on my wrist. But I thought, you know, if I get a new one, I can start it over. Easy. Start it over, you know, I'll engra- yeah, I'll, easy. I'll grave something back. I had a hard time deciding whether I wanted a, a black or a white, but I just wanted a steel Daytona. I didn't want a fancy one. And I just couldn't find one. I wanted to buy it retail through a nice shop and couldn't yeah. find one. Uh, I, I was in an airport, I think in, in uh, might have been in Zurich, and they had a platinum Daytona okay. for some ridiculously high amount of money. And even I <laughs> wasn't going to spend that much on a watch. Um, and it was also heavy. And yeah. I was like, you know, that's just, I don't want something that fancy on my watch, uh, on, my, on my wrist. Yeah. And so I just kept waiting. And it was a couple of years and I had, you know, various people from actually Rolex and other people said, oh, we'll get you one. I'm sure you should have one, blah, blah, blah. Um, but despite being willing to, to buy one at a, at a drop of, of notice, I, I never had access to one. And 
Um, and so, you know, but I, but then I started thinking, well, maybe that's not what I really need. And so back to, to, to Iceland actually, and this okay. gentleman, this famous heart surgeon named Tomas and, and he and I are on a climb. We're in the North of, of Iceland. And this was a big deal. We drove all day to go to this one climb that's meant there were about 17 people from Iceland. And then I was on it. And uh, most of those people had never been to this mountain and climbed it. And we had a beautiful day. And during the climb, uh, I'm talking to this guy, Tomas, who I just recently met. And he had a uh, Rolex on. He has the, uh, I think it's called, and it's a pardon me for not being such a, a, a study, but he had the uh, the Kermit, the GMT Kermit. Is yep. that it? The green? Uh, uh, Submariner green? Kermit, I think. Submariner, I'm yeah. sorry. Sub, I'm sorry. Submariner. And and he's wearing that on on the climb, and and I mentioned the the watch story to him, and we start talking about watches, and it turns out he's good friends with Ed Vesters, mm -hmm. who had just visited him a week or so before in Iceland, and I'm like, Ed Vesters, I know Ed Vesters also. I worked with Ed Vesters back when I worked at the North Face back in wow. in the early '80s. And he mentioned Ed Beasters because of the Rolex connection and because we were both climbing. So at that point, I got this idea. And we, we for the rest of that climb, he, uh, Tomas and I start talking about the metaphors in climbing and glaciers and expeditions and time. And we're having, and, and he's a heart, he's a famous heart surgeon and really intellectual, but also very grounded and outdoor guy and great skier, mountain climber. And obviously, uh, you know, at Vesters, most of your listeners may know that name as, you know, mm -hmm. one of the most accomplished mountain climbers in the world, summited all the highest summits without supplemental oxygen. And, yeah, you know, and I knew him in the early days. Yeah, he had just been sponsored by uh, Mountain Hardware, actually. And I was doing work with Mountain Hardware. And I traveled with Ed when he was doing speaking engagements and just such a humble man. So Tomas and I, there we are in Iceland climbing, discussing our mutual friend, Ed, and what a lovely human he is, talking mm -hmm. about Rolexes, and then talking about the metaphor of time and glaciers, actually, was one of the discussions. Because, you know, climate change and the issues around it, I mean, we as a you know, society has known about this for 30, 40 years, and it's pretty much ignoring it. Mm -hmm. And Iceland had just had its... Uh, a famous glacier had just finally disappeared. Hmm. It was the first glacier to officially go, and Iceland acknowledged that this glacier was gone. And they put up a, a eulogy by where the glacier was. Oh, wow. And so we're discussing all these things and saying, you know, this is intense. But, um, but that's really like you know, how we measure time and that, you know, we're kind of forcing the world to operate on human time when the scales yeah. are quite different. And these, you know, these, it took how many 50, 100 millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years for all this energy to get kind of stuck in the planet. And just within a very short period of time, very resourcefully, mind you, we've pulled all this energy out and we've turned it into stuff and popped it up in the air. And, it's such a fast transition that, of course, there's an effect. Mm. And to deny this effect is just simply selfish. It's like, you know, I enjoy a good drive in my Porsche like the next, next guy. And it's yep. fascinating. But when you really think about it, I mean, metaphorically, but also just basic physics, the amount of time it took to make that energy that just I burn in that car in 30 seconds the, the yeah. concept of time, it's a uniquely different proposition. Mm. So let's just acknowledge that's true and say that yep. it's amazing. And let's make some different choices going forward. And so we started thinking about this practically. And we started thinking about my friend, James. We started thinking about my watch. Yep. And then I started talking to Tomas. Like, you know, Ed Vesters told me a long time ago that like in an expedition, when you're climbing a mountain, the most important thing is getting down the mountain. And those climbers who forget that make mistakes and summit when they shouldn't and often don't return home. And Ed was fantastic and level-minded at knowing when to turn around. And he made many attempts on, on many of the world's biggest mountains, but didn't summit. Turned around within sight of the summit saying, nope, not today. Come back Ooh. another day. And that patience uh, and intelligence is what allowed him to be so successful. 
And just like Paul Newman, Ed Veesters will admit honestly that in the early days of climbing, his Rolex Explorer uh, actually was used uh, to help him. And, wow. uh, you know, there were times when he really looked, used it in the tent and it was, he trusted that piece. And I made that analogy. Like, wow, that's cool. Because many of us just think these, they're ornamental things. Like who the hell really uses these yeah, watches? Yeah. But at least at the, yeah, but at the, and at Vistas, you'd think he'd be wearing a fancy Sunto Navigator, blah, 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 watch. And he doesn't. And part of that's tradition and, mm -hmm. and respect. But it's also just like he got his start doing it. And, and, and if Paul Newman was alive today, I, I damn, he'd still be wearing an analog watch. You yeah. know, I mean, it's just because there's a point in time where you go, this is actually enough and it's cool. And it reminds those of us to kind of slow down and wind the damn thing. And, you know, of course, Ed's not winding his and I'm not winding mine. But but the point is that this is a good meditative time out. So anyway, so back to back to Iceland. There we are talking about this. And I'm like, you know, this all this work I'm doing to try and get people to understand climate in, in a way you could say like we as a as a people have kind of summited the mountain of carbon and we've had our party and we've blown all this oil and it's time to get safely down the mountain if we just admit mm -hmm. that that's what has to happen now and mm -hmm. we need poets and we need mountaineers and we need expedition leaders and we need scientists we have to come together to solve these problems and we can do it and and do it with joy and do it with productivity and help our economies. This can be a fantastic challenge for humanity if we treat it that way. And so I, at that moment, I'm thinking, you know, shit, Ed Veesters wears a, an Explorer and this is an expedition that I'm trying to do. And maybe that's my watch. And I got off the mountain and I reached out to Ed Veesters and said, hey, Ed, what a coincidence. I was just climbing with Tomas. We're talking about you, talking about your Rolex. And I just started thinking this might be my watch. And wouldn't you know it, um, uh, I, I call this jeweler in Vegas who I've been yep. asking about the Daytonas. And this this is a, um, I, uh, and she said she was one of the jewelers that said, you know, we, we get a lot of Rolexes. I'm going to call you. We're going to get you a Daytona. So yep. I called her up and said, you know, I think I want an Explorer. She's like, oh, my God, we got an Explorer 2 in white dial today. Perfect. And I'm like, goosebumps. I want it. Can you hold it for me? <laughs> and she said, sure. And I, you know, I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll be down there. I literally went down the day after. Um, and that was like two days later, I flew to Vegas and I bought yep. the watch. And there in her studio and Rolex had just done a little promotion on the Explorer too. So they had the Rolex magazine there. That was a feature on that. And Ed Veesters is in it. And there I am doing what I do, telling my stories to her and her staff. Like, oh my God, Ed Beasters, the Rolex Explorer. Like, this is my watch. I found it. The hell with the Daytona. <laughs> and um, so then, of course, I followed up with Ed Beasters, and I'm telling him how I want him to go back to Iceland with me. And I want to build some momentum around this story. And the Explorer just, you know, the Explorer is the right watch in so many reasons. One, it's, it's steel. It's simple. It's understated. I have a feeling, you know, I'm going to wear this thing. I'm going to beat the hell out of it. And it's still going to be doing what it did just like my Daytona. That's and what it's made it's, for. Yeah. You know, it just, it's the right watch. And, you know, there were times where I felt like, okay, I can't get my Daytona. I'm going to go get an Omega. I'm going to mm -hmm. find something nice Omega. I'm going to sit there flipping the bird with my Omega and send it to Rolex. Like, <laughs> you know, you know, sorry, giving up on you guys. But I feel good about it. I mean, I feel good about having a Rolex. And I think that's just such an awesome watch. And I pretty much feel like that's all I need. That's a great right. feeling. Uh, I think we're all wondering, have you had the back engraved? Not yet. And that I'll have to call you back. I've got some ideas, but I don't want to share them yet. I bet um, you did. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I've got some ideas. And uh and, and I think, and we have some plans. We're doing some work in Iceland and we're going to get Ed there. And, you know, this, this I think is good for the watch community. I mean, I think that mm. there's so many cool people in the watch community that love these watches and the watches have so many stories. And of course they're told in various ways, but I think uh, this idea of, 
you know, charity and playing it forward um, is something that we can, we can do more of and we can have a lot of fun. Agree. And yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what I'd like to, like to continue. But for the, for now, this one's mine <laughs> and it's yeah, nice to have something that I could just wear and, you know, and, and like I said, at least there's embodies a lot of those uh, principles that I, that I saw in Newman, the humility and the, um, the, the accomplishments he's made and making good choices. And I think he is completely game to engage a little bit more in, in some of the climate work. And he may pull Rolex in a bit because he's still their poster boy. Mm. Um, um, but again, that other point I think that's interesting that again, these are, you know, my watch was used authentically and Ed uh, still uses his. And these aren't, you know, it's not marketing fluff. Um, mm. And some things are, I think that it, at least in this case, it's it's very authentic. And that's what, uh, you know, Celine Cousteau would say about her granddad too, that, you know, back when she was a little girl diving with him and working, I mean, these, especially then, these were very important life and death tools uh, for people. And those of us that enjoy them, just as collectibles, um, I think they're more of a, a symbolic reminder of, of simplicity and honoring time in that way. Yeah, amazing. And I think that, you know, this has been a incredible chat for, for Felix and I to be on. Uh, hearing hearing that whole story, hearing, and, and it makes you realize that, yeah, this watch lasted 30, 40, 50 years and buying well-made things and, and quality products uh, does feed into that sustainability uh, side of things as well because it's sort of uh, by, by less but high quality. And I think that that's, this story perfectly represents that. You know, every, this, the, the fact that this quality thing has then gone on to, you know, help you uh, do all this amazing work, which again will kind of link up for everyone, is also really, really special. And even just the, the, kind of the thread that runs through this which is the connections and you know the people that you know you've met and then that have gone on to to do other things and meet other people and how it sort of brought everyone together and that sort of community element is is really really cool um you know it's just sort of made me thinking well i'm kind of hearing about you know you've bounced to this person and then met that person and you're kind of mentioning you know uh paul butros and and you know people that we actually know as well and it, it's it just kind of is this lovely reminder that you know we can do great things and, and, and kind of play our part. And, and also just that, you know, this, this hobby can have a bit of purpose. So James, this has been a, uh, incredible chat and I just, you know, I think Felix will probably jump in as well and just sort of thank you for, for sharing your incredible story with us and, and generously kind of giving an hour of your, your precious time. Absolutely. Oh, I'll I'm just, so, I'm so honored. Thank you. I, I'll just add James that this has been, um, the dream interview really i mean you just uh, we don't have to say anything because everything you say is just <laughs> it's just great i mean it's it's uh you know even the stuff that you probably don't don't think really is the yeah. meat of the story it's just uh, it's a real treat to to sort of get these insights about something that uh, for our little part of the world is hugely significant so thank it, you for taking the time to share and you know what i've just i've just realized is that so Julie was there at the auction, Julie Crowless, and she was there kind of finishing off the uh, her, her illustration of the, the Newman Newman. And she did, I think, 12 prints or two sizes and 12 prints. I have one of those prints and it's like I've just been triggered that that was because of this. And I was so obsessed with that moment that I that I bought one of her prints, and you know we've we've kind of been good friends since, and and, and Felix as well knows Julie quite well, but. It's just, yeah, it's, a, it's crazy when you kind of. It's what watches can it's do. A crazy huh? small yeah, world. yeah, it's super fun, and I've wanted one of her prints, and I'm sure I'll I'll make that happen at, at one point. She does such great great work, but yeah, I really appreciate it, uh, Felix and Andy. It is I haven't sat there and just kind of bantered on and told the story in a long time. Um, I try and make it very short when I meet somebody <laughs> who's wearing a nice. I meet some guy in the airport wearing a Rolex, and I'll go up and say, "Hey, what are you, you into watches?" But I, I really appreciate it. It's fun to tell it. And um, and I, I, I really have loved the community that I've gotten to know. And I've actually, you know, I've kept in really close contact with many of the folks in, in the industry because they're just such good people. And it's mm. fun. Like I said, they're, you, you guys are all quirky, and, but it's quirky yeah, yeah. in a fun way. But again, I think the point here is that, you know, my story is unique, of course, but we can all 
kind of create our own versions of it, even if it's just intimately in our families. And maybe everybody does this, but I hope that's what people realize is that these things are super precious and passing them along in a meaningful way um, is so cool. And who knows what will happen? I mean, Paul wasn't around to see what happened. And he, you know, I doubt he consciously knew what he was doing at the time. But even giving a watch to, you know, to somebody in your family, I mean, who knows what's going to happen? Oh, my, you know, my granddad gave me this cool Panerai or whatever the hell it is. It's just mm. super cool. Um, and as you mentioned, also, the, the economics of quality is so important. I think that the amount of work that goes into making these things is so special. It's such an example of what's possible that for me, it is a good metaphor for climate and everything. Look what we can do. We can make these incredible complications and we also yeah. can go out and solve these complex problems. So thank you so much. I, I so appreciate your time. And um, anybody who listens, who wants to get involved in anything or suggest anything, you can find me through that. Through yeah. That we'll link website. everything it's out. Not, you know, yeah, it's not an amazing website. I try and keep up. There's many, many, many more projects that uh, we don't feature. We try and feature the ones that need some help and some uh, and some leverage. Yeah. Awesome. Well, James, thank you so much, Felix. Uh, better, better the second time around, maybe the third for the loyal listeners. James Cox, what a what a great guy. Uh, what a good really, I love storyteller. I never get I never get sick of hearing it. Thank you to Adam Straps for supporting OT as we enter the new year. Yep. Um, new year new strap is the is the saying we're going with so make sure you check those out uh <laughs> join our discord email us ot the podcast at gmail.com instagram, instagram felix i mean instagram OT. yeah ot.podcast i mean you can do that you can send us dms sit in our request folder for a while until one of us notices you and then we'll ignore you discord man get in discord <laughs> let's just do it uh all right well felix it's been great i'm gonna week. work on some new year's resolutions see you guys